biblical principles we teach are faith, healing, authority of believer, and it is excellent. It's absolutely excellent. Um, every Wednesday night, we serve dinner here from 545 to 645. We're also finishing up our uh, practices for the ensemble. We'll be uh, ministering our song we've been working on on the 26th, so we're looking forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. But that's uh, Wednesday night at 545. Remember to get with Carla Fanagrosi if you want to help out in our Garden of Eaton. If you take a look back there, we've got some things coming up. It looks good. It's going to be fun. Uh, starting in May, every, uh, Friday Night Fun Club is the second Friday of every month. Um, please see Lynn Lewis for details. It's a great ministry here. Four hours, they'll take your children, feed them for a very reasonable fee, and you can go with a date night and uh, take the mom out that's important in your life. How about that? Um, also, Sunday, May 26th, uh, we have a church-wide picnic with swimming and fishing. There, we actually have flyers now in the back with details on this. There's a sign-up sheet in the foyer to bring uh, to let us know how many people are coming, and we need to know how much food to order, correct? And then details on what to bring are also back there, including things such as fishing poles and towels and things like that. Um, our teenagers are sponsoring the Douglasville Pregnancy Center, the, the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in the county. Y'all, I'm telling you, that is a phenomenal ministry. It's a ministry that happens uh, just this, what was it, yesterday. Um, Andrea called me, she kind of heard a scream, and I ran downstairs, and she uh, had seen a snake going across our driveway. It was about, you know, this long, and it was, uh, it was a king snake. That's what it was, one of those little black king snakes. And I said, I said, that snake, I said, you can't pay a company enough money to provide the service that that snake provides. Right. It, it eats rodents, it eats all these vermin, things we don't like, it eats poisonous snakes, and it's not poisonous. All right, it, and it does that 24 hours a day. We don't see it, we don't have to think about it. I don't have to think, did I do anything for my king snake today? It just happens. All right, I'm telling you, that's how this pregnancy, I'm telling you, it's the same thing. That's how that resource center works. You, a lot of people in the county have no idea it exists. You don't have to think about it, but 24 hours a day, there's people there that minister to young girls with crisis pregnancies. They explain to them what's growing inside their womb. They explain to them that, no, you don't have to give this child up, that, that this child can come forth and, and be a minister. And I, I guarantee you there are people in this county you know that would not have been born had it not been for that ministry. You don't know how much happens every single day and every single You don't know how important your life is. That's why it's so important to come into his presence. That's why it's so important to get built up on Sunday morning because you don't know who you're going to influence. You don't know the next word you're going to say to someone that changes your life. You just don't know what people are going through. You have no idea what people are going through. We've, we've, we've had experiences. We've had discussions about people where, you know, things happen. We're like, I mean, we, years ago, we had some uh, two teenage guys come to a church service one time, saw them one week. Never saw him again. The reason we never saw him again, that weekend, they both got killed in a car accident. And, but that, that one service was one time we had an opportunity to smile. We had an opportunity to minister God's love to them. And, and you just don't know in your daily walk who you're going to come into contact with and who you're going to influence. So, so take this seriously, y'all. Take it serious. I love what, what he, said. He, said, he said. Here we expect miracles. And, and miracles can be ears opening, and it can be lame walking, and that's wonderful. But sometimes the miracle is you get just a perfect seed planted in you where you can go minister to someone and change their life, and you have no idea it happened. That is a miracle. That's God. That's his, in his orchestration and what he does in our lives every single day. He can do things that cause you to influence and have treasures and reap harvest that you don't even, you, you'll think, where did this harvest come from? And it's because seeds you planted that you didn't know they planted. That's when the, that's when the, the, the reaper starts overtaking the sower. It's, it's because you have more coming in than you even knew you had planted to begin with. That's how it works. Yeah, here we go. And I've still got two more, so uh, yeah. Sorry, live streamers. <laughs> Um, finally, we also want to say thank you so much to everyone who helped with the uh, Watson family dinner, that service. Thank you so much. I know um, Andrea headed that up, and she mentioned to me that it was kind of easier this time than it's been in a while. Deborah helped out. So everyone who helped with that, thank you so much. Um, that's, that's what church is about, church body coming together and ministering to each other. And then uh, finally, um, if there's someone who wants to minister this morning, we have an opportunity. We need someone to make a hospital vis visit to Cobb Wellstar and uh, to lay hands on the sick. If that's you, if you feel your belly fluttering, if, if you feel like the Spirit's moving for you to do that, um, just see Pastor John after the service. He'll give you the details, and, and we can take it from there. All right, well, let's worship Father with our tithes and offerings this morning. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, if you'll come up. 
the, uh, I said, let's try that again. We're going to worship God with our tithes and offering this morning. We're going to give with a cheerful heart. Amen. That's right. Um, they are passing out our prayer cards now. If you need a cash envelope, if you'll be giving in cash, please raise your hand and these men will serve you. The uh, cash envelopes, obviously, us, it gives us an opportunity to give you a receipt of your giving. And then the prayer cards, most everybody knows the drill in here on these. This is, uh, it gives us a record of your attendance. Please fill it out at length. But also, please put your prayer request, any pressing needs that you're praying for this week, praying for right now. We do look at them, we do pray over them, and we do believe with you. This is a point of contact for the church body here to agree with you over anything that's concerning you in your life right now. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to fill that out. And while we're filling it out, I just want to impress them. I'm, I'm just excited about this service. Thanks. I think we've already had an excellent service. I'm looking forward to what's going to happen the rest of the service. It's just, uh, um, yeah, Alan, if you'll come up for me. And play just whatever you'd like. A little chord progression for us. That's perfect. And now remember, y'all, when, when we're giving tithes and offers, again, this is not just part of the service that we have to do to just pay the bills this week. This is an opportunity. This is part of the worship service. We worship and honor God with our tithes and offerings. So right now, let's just lift our hands. Everyone in unison and one accord, the one thing is the body of Christ. We can all do together at the same time. Let's lift our hands. Father, we worship you this morning. We praise you, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the promises in your word regarding our finances and with regard to giving. Father, right now, in Jesus' name, I speak the end from the beginning. I say that every single seed sown in this offering produces 30, 60, and 100-fold returns in every person's life as a result of giving in this offering. Father, I thank you that every seed that's sown is sown properly, that it's sown with a heart of cheerfulness, that we're excited to give. Father, I thank you that every seed sown, that it's named. Go ahead and name your seed right now. Tell God what you're expecting and tell him, I expect, I expect my finances to improve as a result of this offering. Tell him, say, Father, I expect you to prove yourself. I, I put pressure on the word. I love that statement. I put pressure on the word. It's 100%. It never fails. It always works. It always comes through. I put pressure on the word, and I say that everything that comes into this offering, that it produces seed and that it produces fruit in people's lives in Jesus name. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for wisdom for everyone here in authority in the church to use this offering exactly according to your will that every dime is spent just like you want us to and that we don't waste one penny. We thank you for the wisdom to be able to do that and we thank you for it right now in Jesus name. Amen. Gentlemen, you can serve the people.
put those words up on the on the platform up on the some folks, isn't it? It's easy for him to play. It's easy for her to sing. <laughs> Praise the Lord in the house, y'all. Say this, I am word wise. I am not otherwise. Because otherwise don't work. <laughs> in Jesus' name. All right, take a Bible. I know we did service a little bit different this morning than we normally do, but that's okay. Who says we have to do it a certain way every time? The only thing we know that we can depend on that's always going to be the same is going to be the Word. I like that. Just heard a voice right behind me say, I have the differences of administration. I like that. Seeing if he's got anything else he wants to say before I dismiss our children, the kids on the word. Differences of administrations. You just administer it different than somebody else would. But it's the same thing. Same word administered different ways. Same Holy Ghost administered different ways according to the differing moving of that gift of the Spirit and that gift of the ministry. Kids on the Word can be dismissed at this time. Those of you that are watching by live stream, as, I, as my son said earlier, welcome. We have a children's church here. If you ever decide to come to church on the Word, bring your children with you. We have a, a service for them that operates simultaneously. We like, I liked as a pastor to bring our children into the worship service so the kids can watch mom and dad worship. Babies watch by example. And when the babies, like my granddaughter, I was watching my granddaughter worship and dance and spin around, and once in a while she'd blow a kiss to heaven. And, and uh, I've never seen anybody do that. I learned that myself from her, so let's, 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 do, let's do what she did. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I wanted to apologize to God after I saw that. I said, Lord, I'm sorry i never done that for you. 
I'd learned that from a baby. Well, I don't have a pair of glasses, so I guess I'll just wing this. Well, wait a minute, may I, maybe I do. It's a miracle. Yeah, focus. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I didn't know there was so much in this verse of Scripture. We're going to continue on today with our teaching that we began a few weeks ago called the School of Higher Learning. And it's a school we all go to. Everybody in here has been to this school. I like it. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's put the scripture above. Verse 16. All scripture. Say that out loud. All scripture. Genesis. How about that one? Nahum. <laughs> yeah. Haggai, Habakkuk, Matthew is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Thank God every time I'm in the Word, it profits me. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Somebody said to me, you just can't be perfect. The Bible says you can. Jesus said, be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now, that's a, that's a pretty high goal, wouldn't you think? That the man of God may be perfect, which means fully mature, and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And uh, we'll do another little quick round of... Um, Rereading and a little bit of a refreshing here. We talked about how that um, these four things doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness can be likened unto elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. And everybody has to go through doctrine. Does anybody in here, can, is there anyone in here that can tell me that you are right now employing what you learned in first grade with your ABC? You are, aren't you? Your ABCs are doing you good right now because you're using ABCs to build into words and words into sentences and sentences into paragraphs and all into, into spoken word. And we can read because we learned our ABCs in first grade. We learned doctrine and we're employing right now what we learned in the earliest days of our development, aren't we? So it's, the teaching never becomes obsolete, does it? Now, <laughs> so all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is good for... Elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. And we talked about elementary school being doctrine. Everybody's got to have a basic teaching. And you've got to frame your constitution. And, and a doctrine simply just means something that's taught. It's related to the word docile, which means an easily taught pupil, easy to lead and manage, eager to learn, yielding to supervision, direction and management. It's much easier to learn doctrine when a good example is set in front of you. So your teacher has to have a good, be a good leader and good example and and uh, then uh, we talked about how that in 1 Peter he said, as newborn babies desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Now, ultimately, we're all going to get to instruction in righteousness, and that is the goal. Because right standing with God is the central theme throughout the Old and New Testaments. The whole reason God called Abraham was because he knew he would believe him, that he would raise his children and his household after him, and he could give him the headship of the father of faith through whom Christ would come, and you know the rest of the story. However, righteousness, the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, we've got to understand, to get to right standing with God, we've got to go through faith. Otherwise, you're going to go through something else that's not going to be credited to your account like some sort of a, a dead work. Now, don't let me get started on that. However, <clears throat> Paul, uh, Peter said, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And the first thing you're going to taste out of that milk of the word is that the Lord is gracious. 
And there's every person in here, including the pastor, that has needed the grace of God. Hallelujah. Now, then we talked about the schoolmaster. Middle school is reproof. Fault finding is a rude awakening, but when the mirror reveals it, this is what the mirror of the word is, then um, it's, we season it with God's grace. It makes it a joyful experience, and it's, it's where I learn how much God really loves me. The milk has allowed me to taste the, the Lord's grace, and the schoolmaster has led me there. Reproof means light. All reproof is, is God saying, all right, see this right here? I want you to straighten this out. <laughs> Jane said something to me the other day that I didn't really think about until she said it. I've been a pastor in this church nearly 20 years now, and I've known you teaching the Word 35 years, and you have never taught correction and reproof to anyone for any reason. I have never heard you teach reproof. I didn't know that. I, the Word has always reproved me. I've always felt like it was, I needed to mind my own business and straighten up my own life. And straighten up your life. I've, I've, I've never had an issue if you've ever felt like I preached at you. Coincidentally, I didn't even preach at anybody. I've never done that. But I know this, the Word will preach right at you. And you'll see yourself in it. You'll, you'll see some in here that somebody did something wrong, you'll go, Ooh. you'll see the mirror. You'll see in here something, something wonderful that someone did that was so wonderful and right, and you say, I've done that. Either way, you see yourself in the Word. So, reproof is just having the light shed, which is the Word, on your life, and it reproves you. It'll point this out. Now, that anger thing you're going to have to deal with. Listen, that unforgiveness thing you're holding against that person, you're going to have to deal with that. That's all reproof is, is God telling you. This is something, it's his, it's his right to expect, it's his right to disapprove of something or to express disapproval of something. That's all it is. Now, he doesn't just leave you there just by saying, this is wrong. He always brings the light, and that's where we're, gonna, we're going to next. This, this message today will be called Moving On Up. We're moving on up. Correction. correction is simply something offered or substituted for a mistake or a fault. Now, isn't that sweet? It's something added or subtracted from, added to or subtracted from, for the purpose of making accurate. That's all it is. Rather than just tell you this is wrong and then leave you in the dark and not know how to fix it, he'll give you correction. Say, now this is how we correct this. And get you if I've got a road map. It's just so easy if I've got the road map. I like what you kept saying. He said, so. no problem when we got the road map. Now, God's word will be your road map for your living. And it's easy. 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 He is not, a, he, he's not ugly to you. Now, he'll be straight. Be honest. Which is very refreshing to be around those people. God's real honest. His yes is yes. His no is no. And he usually doesn't say much more. Do you want me to do so? Have a man call out to you. Oh, I guess I'd like to go. I don't know. I said, Lord, do you want me to go there? And he said, no. He said that to me. No. And I was waiting on him to tell me why, and he never did. But I never went. He just said no. And one time, a man in North Carolina asked me to come to ministry. And I had a flood in me, and I said, Lord, you want me to go there, don't you? He said, yeah. What am I supposed to do?
scary to go to high school because all these upperclassmen around you, there's always threats that you might be initiated, all sorts of things. You have to find your class. The first time I changed classes was in high school in eighth grade. Our county was, we didn't really have a middle school. We had like a hybrid of middle school in both elementary and high school. But uh, our first year of high school was eighth grade and we changed, had to change classes for the first time. And, you know, I, it, it was just all new to me, but the pep rally was It is very scary. Responsibility in growing up is scary, which is why so many people don't want to do it. They'd just rather just stay down here, stay young, and just. Let me just encourage you to get started. There are 31 problems that each of the Bible. He called it Proverbs. It's your daily wisdom. And it's amazing how if you'll just read the proverb that uh, correlates to the day of the month. Today is the 12th. So what should be your proverb of the, of the day? Proverb 12. See, it, now that's very elementary, eh, my dear. Elementary. And um, the, you just cannot, it's amazing how the proverb will speak to you for what you need that week when you're reading through it one at a time. Proverbs chapter 3. We're talking about high school. We're talking about correction. Verse 11 says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, even as a father the son in whom he delights. Now there's another New Testament verse that, uh, where Paul was quoting that. I I'll, I'll gave you that last week. He said that if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, you, you're, you're a fatherless child. But because the Lord loves us, he'll correct us. If we're worth something, he'll correct us. A child left to himself, grows up knowing that his parent didn't care enough about him even to correct him. And I have, I've talked to kids and in, in, um, young people in, in jail across a glass, on a telephone, through the, the wire mesh glass, and I had one kid tell me, he said, you know why I'm in here? Because my parents never trained me and told me anything. Constantly talking about his mom and his dad. And he said, they come here and tell me they love me, but they don't love me. If they loved me, they didn't mind. They'd have minded if I'd have been out at 3 o'clock in the morning, but they never said anything to me about it. And see, he was mad at his parents for never correcting him. Correction means I love you. You ever spanked a child and a few minutes later they crawl up in your lap and want to get it right? Correction is a wonderful thing. And for those of you that are politically correct and want to sue me or send me ugly emails because he advocate spanking children I can tell you my kids turned out that's what I have to say about that <laughs> and believe me you would much rather have children that turn out than children that don't Amen. I've learned this when it comes why am I getting off on this raise your children right if you don't they'll give you another opportunity they'll bring theirs home for you to raise and leave you with them that's a fact you'll get a chance again just get these right and then they'll have sense enough to raise their own and then you can be grandparent where they bring them to you and then you get to send them home and that's a wonderful thing too we love to see them go we love to see them come it's always there whether coming or leaving it's wonderful Proverbs 15, <laughs> but I've watched, I've watched my kids raise their kids, my grandkids, and they're doing, a, they're doing a better job with my grandkids than I did with them. That's the way it ought to be. Amen. Proverbs 15, verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsakes the way, and he that hates reproof shall die. 
A lot of kids died young because they couldn't be corrected. We went to a funeral a few years ago of a little girl named Emily. Emily was in a terrible automobile accident. Her brother called and told my son that she should make a full recovery. So right at first we didn't seem too concerned until we found out later that her right ankle was crushed so bad that they, were, they couldn't even tell what it was. And if she lived, they would have to amputate that foot. And her internal organs were so messed up, they couldn't fix it. And as the days progressed, she passed away on Christmas morning. We went to the funeral. Of course, we were heartbroken about it. And her uncle gave the eulogy. And here's what he said. And boy, light just flooded the place. He said, my niece was the original wild child. She didn't like, she was terribly impatient. The night that she was killed, she was pouring down rain, windshield wipers in full tilt, but still couldn't wipe the, the water off fast enough. And there was a car in front of her that was going slower than she expected they should be going, and she got mad and gunned it and came around across a double yellow and hit somebody head on. See what impatience does? See what she said, but he said, we have told her over and over again to obey the traffic laws. See? There's an exact description. I think of her every time I read this scripture right here that says, he that hates reproof shall die. Now, this teaching gets better, y'all. It really does. But I'm teaching this because I want us to live. Proverbs 22. Now, speaking of traffic, I talked to a guy that uh, had spent 10 years in federal prison for drug trafficking. When he got out, I got to be his pastor. And, uh, yeah, it was a different kind of traffic. He uh, one day told me, he said, you know, you made me mad one day. And I thought, a guy that used to be an enforcer and a, and a, and a uh, bill collector for a dope dealer. He, he could go in and collect for the dope dealer. If nobody could collect, he could. He'd pistol whip them until they decided to give up. He said he had one guy down in his book that he wrote, down on all, all four while he was beating him with a pistol. He said, pay up. He said, I don't have the money. He said, I beat him again. He said, blood's pouring out of his nose and onto the floor. And he said, I've got a title to that Ferrari out there. He said, get it. He said, so we went and got the title and the Ferrari. He said, I went back to my dope dealer, and we rejoiced over collection. We got the Ferrari and the blood-soaked title, and we hit the free base bong over it. Pastor, why do you tell me that? Because I was his pastor. I made him mad one day and told him, shut up. I did. Now, I did, had not known that he had done that before. I might not would have told him to shut up if I'd known that early. But he was mouthing off, and I said, Larry, shut up. Just shut up. He got mad. His neck turned red as your shirt. Smoking mad. Nobody tells me shut up. Nobody. Nobody tells me shut up. Next thing I knew, he came. I heard tires squall as he locked down the, just the back tire of his truck. He was getting his lawnmower out, and he was cutting my grass at my house. I thought, what is he doing? His wife called me later and she said, he came through the house mad at you because you told him to shut up. Then all he could do, he couldn't, he couldn't get, get still enough around here until he did something for you. And he had to go cut your grass. And, and he weeded and cleaned up and took out the trash and did some stuff. And I thought, what's, what's up with this picture? He had never been corrected. He never had that feeling of somebody that loved him enough to tell him just to shut up. And he had great respect for me till the day. We had mutual respect for each other till the day that he passed on. So the pastoral ministry can be interesting. <laughs> Correction. It's a wonderful thing. Proverbs 22, verse 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is bound there. But the rod of correction drives it far from him. Drive, if I thought every smack 
of a little switch on a little fanny and a set of legs would drive foolishness out of my child. It don't take long. You should be done with it by the time they're eight, nine years old. And, the, and so, because you want them adult, you, your, your, your goal is to raise a responsible adult, but don't wait till they get to adulthood before you start. They should be done by the time that you're about 15 years old because you know they're fixing to drive next week, next year. And while they've got their learner's license, I want to know that a responsible adult is about to helm the wheel before they leave driving on their own. So, anyway, the rod of correction drives foolishness far from them. This is high school. It's still high school in the realm of the spirit. Let's look through uh, one more proverb, and then I'll share a story with you, and we'll close up. Proverbs 23 very simple. Isn't this, isn't this an easy teaching? Isn't this simple? This is not hard. Proverbs 23, verses 13. Withhold not correction from the child. For if you beat him with the rod, he won't die. You shall beat him with the rod and deliver his soul from hell. Well, that's worth it. Huh. It's not politically correct to spank spank it all anymore and I would tell you if you don't want to stay if you want to stay out of trouble don't spank your children in public because there's always some Bertha better than you church lady that's going to get you in trouble but at home who in here in this congregation by show of hands would tell me that your mother smacked you with a rod when you were a child now here we are ladies and gentlemen some things are time honored my mama see and you know what? One of the most misquoted scriptures in all of the Bible is the one that says, spare the rod and everybody says, spoil the child. And that is absolutely a misquotation of scripture. Scripture says, if you spare the rod, you hate your child and you deliver his soul to hell. My mama loved me. This is just correction. Learn the instant obedience to the voice of the Spirit. Delayed obedience is disobedience. To, to delay is to disobey. Years ago, I'd, I'd always loved airplanes and loved to thought that one day I'd like to fly. And uh, I have kind of put that d desire on a shelf for some years now. But right after we got married, I stopped by Charlie Brown Airport and... Um, Asked them uh, what it, just to inquire what it would cost, and the guy said, "Well, you know, if, if you'd like, I've you know for back then for twenty bucks, I can take you up for a half hour introductory flight." And I said, "In what? An airplane?" He said, "Yeah, that one right there." I was scared and thrilled all at the same time. I paid the twenty bucks. He helped me. He showed me how they check all of the little things on the flaps and went around the little safety check and kicked the tires and checked everything and did the little outside check and we got in the plane and I was about to go out of my skin excited and we taxied out and ran out onto the runway and went down to runway 26 left and turned left and got he got a clearing we took off and here we go he said we're gonna get up at about uh, 50 knots that's about 64 miles an hour and we'll pull off so the little engine we're just running along he said, I'm excited in a minute we got, it felt like I was being pushed into the seat, and there we went. Not real fast. The, the ground was getting lower and lower and lower. And as soon as you get just a little higher, all the ground looks real flat. We turned right, got a heading to the right, and went over those, there's uh, some uh, tanks, water tanks, or some kind of out on Powder Springs. We were right over Powder Springs real quick. And it was just a lot of fun. We had a ball. I just, I mean, he did he went ahead and took me on up for about 50 minutes because he, he loves it too. You know, if, you, if it ever gets in your blood, it's in your blood. And we came back around. We found runway 26 left and again. And we came, here comes the, the runway. And after, the, our, and he starts pulling up on the stick and lifted the front of it up and dropped it down on the back two tires. Boom, boom. Dropped it down on the nose wheel just as pretty as you please and parked it in the hangar and we just had a ball. And a few months after that, family friend. Everybody knows Eddie Haskell. Everybody has an Eddie Haskell in their life. The, the Eddie Haskell we were raised with, his name was Terry Bohannon. He called me. 
He said, Johnny, I understand you want to learn how to fly. I said, I do. He said, well, I've got my pilot's license. He said, I've had them for some time now, and I'm going to be flying to High Point, North Carolina. Would you like me to ride by and pick you up? I said, sure. Well, I had a little check in my gut about it. I said, sure. So he came down to Charlie Brown Airport and picked me up in a little Cessna 172 retractable gear. A little cutlass. Neat little thing. We took off back down runway 26 left. We're going to go to High Point, North Carolina. It was a little more powerful plane. We took on off quick, got our heading to the left. Next thing I know, there's the city of Atlanta, and he's, uh, he's got, we couldn't fly inside the, the, the airspace of Atlanta or near the Atlanta airport, so we turned on, went, made our heading north. We're flying along, and we're getting up towards, um, uh, towards uh, Dallas and Canton and headed toward North Carolina. And he said, put those uh, headphones on and, and uh, so I put mine on, and I'm with him, and we're flying along, and things are good. And he said, uh, I, we hadn't been in the plane 15 minutes, and he says, um, uh, just look for other aircraft right quick. And, and uh, look for other aircraft. God. And sure enough, there was one down there to the right. And I said, there's one down there. He said, oh, yeah, I saw that one a long time ago. I thought, I just saw it way down there, just flying along. In a minute, he says, um, hold the stick right here. And I was holding, he said, hold it right here. He said, just keep the, the edge of the plane on the horizon. He said, i got to look for something. He started looking between on the back, looking for a book. And I thought, I have had one one-half-hour flight, and I'm flying an airplane. But I'm in an airplane with an idiot. I'm just to the right of a dummy. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm flying this plane. What am I doing? What, what, look for other aircraft. Now, my eyes were big. This, now, one other orifice was not so wide, but th my eyes were big. <laughs> I'm thinking, what in God's name? And I'm flying along, and then the, rig the tower calls in. And here's what he said. Cessna 9 or 550 Bravo. Cessna 9 or 550 Bravo, do you read? And he's, he's still looking in the back. I grabbed the, the, the microphone. Cessna 9 or 550, Bravo, we read you. Uh, yeah, make your runway, make your heading, uh, you're at one, one, zero, one, zero. make your heading zero, one, two, and pull up, and you're at 4,500 feet, pull up to 8,000 and advise at this time. I'm waiting on him. He's still looking for something in the back. I thought, I didn't sign up for this. In a minute, he pulls out, and he said, he said, yeah, Cessna 9 or 550, Bravo, make it up one, one, zero, one, two. And he, he pulls up on the stick and pulled out on the throttle. We're pulling up. And uh, he's got it. And he said, um, we'll be at uh, 8,000 in about eight minutes, and I will advise. All right. I said, what was that about? He said, oh, you know, we're headed to North Georgia. There's, uh, the mountains are higher right up there, and so we probably need to go higher to get over it and over to the left to get around it. I went, God. You mean like it's a mountain? <laughs> and I got to thinking, what if we just decided to ignore our instruction? What if we just decided, and all he did was give us a course correction. All he did was tell us, pull up. Simple instruction. You see how important a course correction is? You see how important instantly obeying your instruction is? Hmm. A parent's instruction and correction is for our own good. They've been before us and have been where we are and can see our future pitfalls. This is why I don't care how bad of an argument you're, you got in with your dad or your parent or your grandparent earlier. Just because, and just because your parents make a mistake does not justify deciding that you can't. See, we tend to get the idea that if you can impugn the messenger, you can justify rejecting the message. But even if the messenger is incorrect from time to time, does not mean that his oversight's always incorrect. You should always obey if you're the subject and a child of a parent. Now, heed the voice of experience. I won't tell you what happened all that day, but we did crash that airplane that day. 
Thank God it was on the ground. Second airplane ride I'm in and we get in a crash. But I was off with an idiot. Let me just finish the story. We're up. We got at 8,000. There were the mountains. And we, uh, he set it on automatic pilot. And then, but the automatic pilot in this particular lease back plane was not working. And we got off course and didn't know where we were. So he radioed. And, and uh, finally he said, let me just get on the ground. I need to use the restroom anyway. He turned the plane almost sideways. And there we were. And there was a, a little strip down there that looked like a pencil mark. You could have marked it with a pencil. He said, there's a runway right there. I thought, that didn't look like no runway to me. So he made this big circle, and we dropped, and we dropped, and we dropped, and in a minute, there's that runway, and it's a grass runway, and he pulled up on that, sat down the, the boom, 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 this retractable gear airplane dropped down the uh, landing gear, and he landed, <laughs> landed across this grass runway, and we got out. Went in, used the restroom. There was a man, it was, a, it was like a, really just like his yard. It really wasn't an airplane, air, it wasn't an airport. It was just a guy's backyard. And he, he liked planes, and so he flew his planes from there. And he walked out, and he said, you need, need to get a heading? He said, yeah, I just need to get my bearings. He, they were talking coordinates and stuff like that. And he said, now, when you get up, you're going to have to get up to about 8,000 because there's mountains right here. And now everything in me is knotted up. I don't want to do this anymore. And, so we're taxiing, we got in and we're taxiing down this little gravel driveway. And I'm, I'm seeing these telephone poles every so often. And one of them stuck out a little bit further because they weren't set with a transit, they just kind of, you know, just kind of set them. And I thought, well, I'm not going to tell him watch for that pole right there because he knows he's in an airplane. I mean, what, yeah, I mean, if you're a kid, you don't tell your dad watch for that, you know, curb right there. I mean, you don't tell your instructor. So just as I said, isn't that a little close right there? Before I said, isn't that a little close right there? We hit that telephone pole with the right wing. Pow! Ruptured the, the gas tank. Fluids coming in. I shut the window real quick. And he jumped out and I jumped out. And there's this mangled aircraft right there. I thought, I've been in an airplane crash. I did. It's the first thing I thought. But something in me was... Relaxed, because I knew we weren't going to fly home. <laughs> Felt good. I, my, that, finally, that knot that had been in my gut since the moment I said, yes, I'll go, has left me. So that was the Holy Ghost saying, don't, don't, he's an idiot. Don't, don't. But you know, you can let your desire override your better judgment in your gut. Your wants, your desires, your excitement. It's just like buying something on impulse. You know you really can't afford this $600 payment, but I want it real bad, and I'm going to get it right now. And you got this high-pressure salesman telling you, get it now, get it now, get it now. If you don't, if you leave and come back, then we can't afford to give you this extension of whatever, you know, some kind of reason for why you got to buy it now. All sales in America is, in capitalism is set up so that you, to, to go after your impulse. But you have to learn to be corrected no matter what else is screaming at you, no matter what impulses are talking to you, no matter what excitements are telling you to do this, learn the correction of your gut. There's where high school is, because remember, he's taking you on to instruction in righteousness, and you can't be instructed in righteousness till you come through doctrine, get reproved, and get corrected. And then instruction in righteousness is very much a lot of fun. That guy's in jail now. He is. I love him. He's in prison. I love him. One day he's going to get out, and when he does, I'm going to. I'm not, I'm not going to fly an airplane with him, but I am going to kiss him. I love him. I always have loved him. We've always loved him. I believe one day he'll get out. Talented, gifted. He went to Vietnam. Of course, I've always got respect for any Vietnam veteran. He went to Okinawa. And he learned uh, martial arts. He took off running in our yard one day after he got back from Vietnam and screamed like a banshee and jumped and flew through the air and touched the ring on my basketball goal with his heel. He could do anything. I was always impressed with him. Always loved him. One more story. I went to high school a few years ago, just a few years ago. 
And uh, when I went in, I took an elective class in art. That was neat. They teach how to make things with paper mache and they did wood carving and they did painting and the high school level and a lot of kids were in there doing different things. They even made jewelry. Had these little molds that they put in a kiln. Pull them out and they'd, you'd put um, pieces of metal that you bring from home and you could torch it and get it hot and then drop this plunger down on it and, and, and uh, pump air down in it and drive that hot metal down into a little mold on the inside and uh, whatever the mold shape was is what you were making the jewelry. And a lot of guys made rings and, and uh, really neat. I thoroughly enjoyed the art class. But there was a kid in there named Colin Croft. And the reason I say his name is that if I could find Colin today, I would, I've looked on Facebook and haven't found him. He was, he, he'd probably be 60 years old now. But he was just a kid and he was one of those left brain dominant kids that didn't want to study. So for that reason, he was behind in school. But he was so artistic. He, uh, he met me, and, he, and what, what impressed me about him is he looked like the lead singer for Steppenwolf. He had that hair and looked like, I, I even asked him, I said, did, did you listen to Steppenwolf? No, nah, I don't listen to music much. I said, well, you look like the guy that sings on the album. And we became friends right away. I was in the eighth grade, he was in the 11th grade, and I had this upperclassman that, that wanted to work with me. And he, come here, Johnny, I'll show you how to do some art. I'll show you how to do this clay work. So he took a bunch of clay out of the bin and set it up on the, and we're, he said, just mold anything. you got to get started with your hands. And so I said, I'll make an ashtray. That's my parents smoked like sieves, so I made him a big ashtray. I was, made a big ball, started making it. And, and uh, he took this big um, uh, lump of clay, <clears throat> dark brown clay, and mashed it together. And, you know, you kind of talk like this, you know. And you kind of, he's kind of, you want to try to get it in the shape of what you're looking for to start with. And made what looked like just, like just a clump of a man, legs arms and a head and some shoulders that's all it's about a, about a foot and a half tall big and i'm watching him and in a minute he pulled these little scalpel things that look like little tiny cups different sizes look like little spoons a little wooden handle about that long with a little cup on the end about as big as your finger and he started picking picking digging scraping out scraping this and you have to you know, start just kind of where you see and he said, if you make a mistake, you can always put a piece back if you need to. And he's, he's working. In a few minutes, you can see the muscular look of the arm. He, he's sculpted out the muscle and the elbow. And, he sculpt, and I'm totally amazed. In a minute, he, he's scraping the shoulder down. And then he had this big belt buckle he had sculpted on it. And it had this, uh, it looked like it wore a skirt thing that had like made of, she looked like a shield and had the strap that went crossways on it and then he sculpted out this thing that looked like a sword and had his, his hand came across with the sword and with the handle around the sword like this and he put he, as he kept sculpting his head and he'd scrape and scrape and knock it off scrape and knock it off until finally he had this head with a helmet on it and the his facial expression on the guy started showing I was completely amazed I said what is this he said I just I saw the other day this medieval warrior and I wanted to see if I could make him. He's not looking at a picture, he's going by his memory. I said, how do you do this? Did you go to school for this? He said, no, nah, I just, you know, just kind of always could do it, it seemed like. He said, it's really, I think anybody can do it. He said, you, he said, he said it's real simple, he says, just look at it till you see what you want and just take away what doesn't belong. He said, he said, just get, see what you want and just scrape away what doesn't belong. Hear the voice of the Spirit of God this morning. While He's correcting us, He sees you as a medieval warrior. He already sees the excellent vessel unto honor. Romans chapter 9, I think it's 21, that says, Does not the potter have power over the clay to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Just stand there and submit to Him. Let him scrape off those things off of you. Get rid of all the unnecessary parts of you so that when you... And let him, let him scrape. Be pliable. Let, let him get rid of those things that you love. It's anything that scrapes off of what you're made of, your flesh, is going to hurt. If he says get rid of this because this is keeping the warrior bound inside. 
get rid of this because it's keeping the person that I have designed for you to be from the foundation of the world from expressing itself. Let me dig all this other junk off of you because I have this vessel under honor and I'm sculpting and I want to fix it. Don't fight me. Don't make me take this lump of clay, mash it back together, put it back in the bin, or send you back through elementary school again. Let's get into correction because we're going on to the vessel of honor. We're going on to instruction in righteousness. I've got to have this warrior to come out of this clay. I've got to have you to work the way I want you to work. Somebody say amen. It's 12 o'clock. We've got to go home. See? When he did that, I thought, I was so amazed. His brother John Croft could draw. Just start drawing right out of memory. Just, that's why I'm so impressed with her, her gifts like that. We're going to college, y'all. We're going to be instructed in righteousness. We're going to learn some things. Some of us have learned some things and we're highly developed in one area and not so developed in another. I'll tell you something I've learned about my brother-in-law, Jerry Murphy. I saw him yesterday, the other day. If I went through the whole story to tell you it would be something I shouldn't do but he I've always watched him and there's something he's got that I want I'm pretty good about forgiving people eventually he instantly forgives and it doesn't matter they have been, he has been violated in ways that I'm ready to be his advocate I'm ready to I, I, there's one person that violated him in such a way I wanted to shoot him and tell God he died. But not him. He just passed it on off and then go right on. He was over with some folks recently that had violated him terribly. Now, he didn't encroach in their space at all, but he didn't mind walking back into their world. And I said to him, Jerry, you are an object lesson to me. I want that forgiveness. If that had happened to me, it just about, I just about, like I said, I want to learn how to, to forgive like he does. Because that is an instruction in righteousness that he has. He's gone on to college and to graduate school over that and has learned it. He won't have a lot of bitterness and anger hung up on the inside of him that's going to ex express itself in a disease one day. No, he's just let things go. And, just, he, and he said to me the other day, he said, oh, you can't worry about all that stuff. He said, people are just people. Folks just make mistakes, and it's easy to say things that you maybe wish you hadn't said, but you did. And, and I thought, boy, he's had some stuff scraped off of him. Unnecessary things, because there, in that regard, the vessel of honor shines, the forgiver. He forgives like Christ forgives. Father, forgive them. They don't realize what they're doing. That's what I heard come out of his mouth. Forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Same thing, the same spirit that was on Jesus is on him. It's that being submitted to the, the scraper until that medley, medieval warrior or whatever it is you're being made to look like comes out. Correction. We're going to make it. We're going to grow up. We want to thank you today for joining us here for the WordWise Christian Broadcast. Please join us each Sunday morning at 11 a.m., each Wednesday at 7 p.m. Look us up on Facebook, Church on the Word. And if you're ever in the Douglasville area, please visit. We'd love to have you here in church with us. Thank you for joining us. Remember, God sent us this word right here to get our thinking straightened out. When his mindset becomes our own, our actions change. Peace settles in. Our anchor up to our soul comes into play. And we become word wise. Get in the word. Become word wise because otherwise just don't work. Y'all give our live stream audience a hand. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Jay Alexander, grab that microphone. Let's go. You know, in closing today, we want to share a couple of things with you. First of all, thank you for joining us today for the WordWise Christian Broadcast. The Word is powerful beyond imagination. Religion will always condemn you, but the reality of righteousness will always set you free. In closing, I want to read one final scripture. It's in Romans chapter 5, where 
Paul said, if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, and that's Jesus Christ. If by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, much more then by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. His word's powerful. Join us each week for the WordWise Christian broadcast and watch your life change right before your own eyes. God bless you.